Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Belda Rogers with McGraw-Hill Education, and we are excited to have Dr. Vicki Gibson here with us. She will be discussing aligning instruction with the revised TEKS for English Language Arts for Reading. Dr. Gibson is a national educational consultant, author, and speaker specializing in differentiating instruction, early childhood education, and emergent reading and writing instruction. She completed her master's degree and PhD at Texas A&M University in educational psychology. Currently, Dr. Gibson is CEO and chairman of an educational consulting group that provides professional development and materials for administrators and teachers. Welcome, Dr. Gibson. Uh, welcome to those who are listening. Today I want to talk about uh, the impact of the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skill Revisions and how that will affect teaching and practice in classrooms. Uh, so let's just begin. Thank you for waiting. Um, the big question is, how will the revisions in the TEKS affect teaching and learning? And then also another discussion would be talking about how they'll ultimately affect assessment. A lot of people are concerned about how do we implement the changes in the TEKS in classrooms. However, I don't think that we need to be talking about implementation until we understand what those changes are and how they will have an impact on teaching in classrooms and learning and student practice, particularly collaborative practice, before we start making changes in our assessments. So a recent study that just came out about two weeks ago, it's a RAND study, has shown that as the grade level goes up, the higher in the grades, the less knowledge the teachers and principals and administrators have of the standards and the changes in the standards. And that's concerning because if the outcomes for student performance, those outcomes, of course, would be reflected in our assessments. And if we don't know the outcomes, we may not then be aware of the changes that we need to make in teaching and then students may not receive the types of instruction and practice activities that they need to be prepared to uh, accomplish the outcomes and the standards. So it's kind of a vicious circle. It also shows that 37% of the school leaders could not identify the kinds of reading approaches that will be needed to align with the outcomes and the TEKS and the revisions in the state standards. And 50% of the leaders had difficulty also identifying particularly the changes in the mathematics topics that were allow, uh, aligned with the standards. But today we're going to just address the reading. But because of this, and certainly what we've learned in other states from the implementation of Common Core is that the changes really begin with an in-depth knowledge of what's in the standards and then how they impact teaching and practice. So one of the first things that we want to talk about today because we need to know is what is this difference between difficulty and rigor because they are not the same things and because of our confusion with that we continue to want to give more difficult text or what we call more complex text we want to give more difficult assignments and what the standards want is more rigor and I'm going to go into that in depth in just a moment the also uh, we also need to understand the impact of learning progressions that are in the state standards or the TEKS and how that impacts how we plan activities for uh, instruction and for student practice. And then we want to look at some ways that we can make changes in our uh, classroom activities that will align instruction with those out outcomes. So the rigor is definitely there. The Texas College and Career Readiness Standards include a lot more rigorous outcomes. And so again, we keep going back to this question about, well, what is rigor? Well, if you look at what we typically ask students to do, which is recall and memorize, I mean, traditionally many of our practices involved 
having students read content, answer questions, write responses to questions, then they close their books and we give them an assessment and they perform on that assessment basically from memory, from recall. And that is not in the standards. It's not about memorizing. It's not about being able to just locate information. Rigor is involved with a lot more thinking, a deeper understanding of what that content is, a deeper interaction with that content. And so if we don't provide that kind of instruction in our classrooms, then what's happening and what's going to continue to happen is our students will be used to a lower level of thinking and performance than it's what ultimately will be required on assessments and also in the outcomes of in the standards. So when you look at the type of student behavior that are in these Texas College and Career Readiness Standards, you can see that it's a much deeper understanding and application of the content where students have to analyze and evaluate the information and make comparisons and take it to a whole different higher level of thinking than what sometimes is typically required in a classroom. So difficulty does not equal rigor. Just because something is difficult because a student, let's say, hasn't been exposed to the type of instruction that would demand that kind of thinking, that doesn't mean that it's equal to rigor. Using more complex and difficult text does not make it rigorous. It makes it difficult, especially if the student has not received the type of instruction that would be needed to uh, perform at the level of rigor that this is uh, requiring or that an assignment is requiring or a standard is requiring. So one of the things that I have included here is uh, Dr. Karen Hess's cognitive rigor matrix. And because all of us are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, we grew up on that. Now it was revised and as you see here, but it's basically the same level. That one top level creating doesn't mean you get to go do whatever you want to do. It doesn't mean that kind of creativity. It means that now you take it at the highest level of, of processing, you are now going to create different solutions using the content or the various types of resources. And what Karen Hess has done is she has combined Bloom's taxonomy with Webb's depth of knowledge and trying to show that they are not the same. In fact, Bloom's is about the type of thinking, but Webb's DOK levels are about how deeply you have to understand the content to be able to successfully interact with it. It's like the complexity, the rigor. So Webb's gets more at the rigor and Bloom's taxonomy is more about the kind of thinking that a student has to do to complete the task. And so you can go on Karen's website and download these. She's very famous in this country for looking at learning progressions and the sequence of types of instruction and activities that are needed to scaffold or differentiate instruction so that students will be able to participate in different kinds of activities in the classroom that will prepare them for the rigorous outcomes that are now in the standards. So having said all that, that's kind of complex and, and challenging, but when you look at it this way, the lower level of DOK, level one and two, you can see it's a lot of memorizing, uh, looking for evidence. And this is a new thing in classroom, making students look for evidence and text. Well, that's great, but it's still a very low level of rigorous performance. And so while it's a new habit, and it may be difficult for students because they're not used to referencing the text or the source or the digital resource. They're not used to having to use evidence to support their responses. It's still not a high level of rigorous performance as required in the DOK levels in grade three and four. So when you look at what happens that 
when you get out into three and four, you get into that of analyzing information and using your reasoning and your planning and using that evidence to support inferences and uh, verify predictions and that sort of thing. It's a higher level of thinking. And the sad thing about all of it is while we do some of it, we don't do enough. And what the evidence and the research is showing us is that most of our classroom instruction and student practice focuses down on those lower levels of level one and two, but they're going to be assessed at level three and four. And now you've got a huge gap between what they're receiving as practice and learning in the classroom and what will be required to demonstrate achievement on assessment or uh, attaining these outcomes in the standards. So what I want to do is show you an example. Everyone just about knows this nursery rhyme. And it would not be difficult for you to read it. And in fact, most of us probably have read it, have said it, and think we know what it means. But there's multiple interpretations to text, but you have to dig deeper, analyze more, and think deeper to truly understand what that text says. So I'm going to do this as an activity with you. Now, this is one interpretation of a nursery rhyme. So most of us have used it for just rhyming words, but that's not really the intent here. If I want to take this nursery rhyme, a simple familiar text, and take it to the level of three and four, then this is the way I might do it. First of all, I would have to ask my students, what time, what year, when was this written? And they were written in the 18th century. And back then it was during religious prosecution. And so if you wrote about your faith or spoke about your faith, you could be incarcerated, put into jail or whatever, or you could be killed. And so therefore they wrote in parables. Now the problem with this is if you don't know the key words, the vocabulary words here that are familiar to you, but not in the context of this use. So here, ring around the rosy. The rosy was a sore of leprosy. And so ring around the rosy was actually the infection. Pocket full of posies. Here, they people put flowers in their pockets to offset the smell of rotting flesh. And ashes to ashes is they began to burn the bodies of the corpse of the people who died with leprosy, and that's where you get we all fall down. Now, that's a, 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 a familiar nursery rhyme with a very different interpretation, and the reason that it's so different is because we didn't look at the time in which this was written. We didn't look at the author purpose for why it was written. We researched because I told you what it was. Now, we've looked at it in a different way and used a much higher level of thinking about this nursery rhyme to get the true meaning of it. And that's what I mean by taking something that we do know that's familiar, but teaching students a way of looking at it deeper, thinking about it deeper, understanding it at a deeper level, and taking it up to the application of level three and four. And what's happened in our classrooms is we want to give difficult, more complex text and then teach this new way of managing difficult and complex text. And so now you've got high order or if you want to, more challenging, difficult thinking with more challenging, difficult text, and it's frustrating the students. And so everyone's saying it's difficult. Well, it is difficult to achieve the rigor, but that's where instruction has to change, where the teacher stays in teacher leadership role longer to help the students navigate through this more complex text. So again, my suggestion is, is if you're going to teach a totally new skill application, and that would be teaching them to read more rigorously 
and looking for a deeper meaning and a deeper understanding, then I would probably there use some of my more simpler text to introduce the skill and then level the student back up with a more challenging text. So here is an example of Yertle the Turtle by Dr. Seuss, which his books are excellent for this kind of activity. So if you look at the text, on the faraway island of Salomon San, Yertle the Turtle was king of the pond. If you're familiar with this text, and you can look at the picture book there, it is about a king who is very, very full of himself and wants more and more and more. He's very greedy. So I'm ruler, says Yertle, of all that I see, but I don't see enough. That's the trouble with me. And as this story goes on, he has all of the turtles in the pond continue to stack up so he can get a higher vision. And the you can see it here. So one, the turtles are complaining. They're complaining about their back hurting and that sort of thing. But he orders more and more turtles to stack up. And eventually at the end of the story, he ends up, it topples and he ends up in the mud and whatever. It's another great story that's simple, but you can take it to a very high level of thinking, a more rigorous level of thinking. As, and you ask, what was the per author's purpose for writing this story? It's not just a simple book that you read for the rhyme. It's not a simple book that you just read for the entertainment, but you want to go after the author's purpose, craft, and uh, structure. What is the main idea that's never stated in this text? And it, uh, how does that theme apply to leadership today? And now we're asking the students to take that information and apply it in a real-world setting. And what environment could represent the pond? It's a current environment, and who could Yertle be in your world? And so you can take simpler text and teach the students how to perform at this more rigorous level and then level up and bring that text up. So some of your leveled books that you're in your reading program are going to be really good for that. But you can't start with very complex text and then also go to very complex thinking because there's just not enough working memory and the students working so hard trying to learn the skill that they're still struggling with the text. So the bottom line about rigor is it's about the cognitive demand. It's what is is being required of the student to be able to interact with this content. So cognitive demand or the working memory, it's about the complexity of the thinking to get to that deeper understanding or that deeper application using that information. So rigor is about the effect of what's happening inside the student's head. And difficulty could be the more complex, difficult text, but rigor is about the mental processing required by the students that's now in our standards. So it's measured by the depth of understanding. How well a student understands it, can they use that information, can they apply that information to demonstrate their learning. So it's a change in thinking and practice and increasing the difficulty of the task, giving the students longer tasks or more multi-step tasks or more complex tasks. Increasing the difficulty without providing the kind of instruction students will need for this newer, more rigorous thinking is not going to increase student achievement. If anything, it will likely create more frustration. So the bottom line for that is, is we need to make instruction and student practice more rigorous in terms of interactive uh, more discussion, more collaboration, deeper, better questions so that they develop the thinking habits and skills to perform at a higher level, levels three and four, if you use Web's DOK. The other thing that's different about the revisions in the text is the order of progression, how skills develop over time. And this comes out of a lot of the research on the number of repeated exposures that students and adults 
now need to deeply process information. And so in the design of these uh, outcomes in the TEKS, you're going to see where they develop in one year. Maybe that's at a level of introduction, but maybe the next year is only building upon what they learned the year before, and mastery may not be required. That's very different from traditional practice where we used to introduce something on Monday and test it for mastery by Friday or within six-week you know, grading period. And so I want to show you how that design is. So first, let's just talk a little bit about learning progressions. And so at the top of this slide, you can see that the first level of comprehension to be established is listening comprehension. And in order to listen and comprehend what is being spoken, what is being said, what is being read, then you'd have to have established vocabulary word knowledge. And I think what happens, and I know that I made this mistake as a teacher because I didn't know better, we often try to get to the reading, which you can see here on this slide, that's further down the continuum down the ladder, the first thing we're doing is teaching to that ear and having the students hear that phonological awareness, the syllables in the words, and then hearing the meaning of the word. And I often read the sentence where that word will appear to students, and you will hear the word used like this so that we can talk about how the word is being used in that context, that whatever it is that I'm a poem, a text, uh, informational text, literature, whatever. And so we have really be a, a lot of word work so that when the students read the text, then they also are reading with meaning, not simply just decoding the, the words to read through the text. So a lot of it is phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, looking at the beginning sound, the ending sounds, all of that, there's a lot more word work and oral language before we just release and tell the students to read the text and try to understand it. And so when you look at the fourth bullet, oral language expressive fluency, now the student has had enough work with the vocabulary, and that doesn't mean they're not reading the text yet, that you've taught all the words. You don't need to teach the words if the text will teach the meaning of the word or there's some print concept that will help develop the meaning of the word on the page. But you need to use these words enough in collaborative discussions or conversations in the classroom about some of the details that they can even see in the print concepts, the cover of the page, illustration on page, a legend, uh, equation if it's in math, whatever, but you need to be discussing that so that they own the language so that then when they begin to read, they read with comprehension. And unfortunately, many of our lessons in school start day one with having the students go to read the text, and we've not developed the phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, and the oral language or the vocabulary word meaning such that they can read fluently and understand what they've read. And then writing is the highest form of our language, and it's the last thing we ask the student to do. And often, often we ask students to write about something that they've read about that day, or especially that the teacher has just introduced that day. And from the research that we know about repeated practices and the number of exposures you need to have both to your ear hearing it and to understanding it, we know that that's far too early for a student to be successful. So a learning progression, an easy way to remember that is in this diagram where you see at the top, you see here, that means that the student needs to be able to hear words spoken or read to or read with and they've got to be able to hear, hear the sounds in that word so that when they are left to read independently, they can rely on that sound system to be able to decode that word. They need to see it. That means understand it. They can see visuals. That always helps to understand new concepts or old information used in a new way. But they need to hear it, and they need to be able to see it, and they need to be able to say it. That's that oral language 
that needs to be developed before they're just released to decode print and try to read through the word. So the basically your first triangle of trying to introduce new content or new skills to a student is that hear, see, say before they do, and the do would be the reading or the writing in response to something that they've read. So the learning progressions are represented in the peaks. There's print concepts on the far left of this diagram, and that means any concept that can be re represented in print. This is not printing as in writing a word, printing a letter to write a word. This is a picture, an illustration, a diagram that represents a concept. And a lot of our students have been taught to go directly to the text and begin to decode the text and try to read the text without visually looking at any of the print concepts that may appear on the page that would jumpstart prior learning, prior knowledge, and help jumpstart comprehension as they read. And so an easy way to tell if a student's doing that is you just put a book in a, with a picture or print concept on it, put it down in front of them and watch their eyes. If they immediately begin to read the text, then you know they're not using any of the visual supports to jumpstart their prior learning before reading the text. And then you can see as the arrow moves to the right, it goes to phonological awareness. Again, that is that being able to segment words in a sentence on the uh, lowest level, kindergarten, first grade, and then being able to segment words into syllables, and then finally to phonemic awareness to isolate sound to be able to code to read. And then you see your phonics rules and your high-frequency words, word recognition, and then you see fluency. But what's happening is we're not doing our homework in the first three boxes before we are trying to assess fluency. And fluency is something that will develop with this oral language, with this repeated exposure, and with this repeated reading. And so because this is now represented in the text, these learning progressions are in the outcomes, that's where I wanna show you how they appear. So the TEKS include both learning progressions and the more rigorous outcomes, and those outcomes are to be achieved by the end of the year. This is where it's going to affect assessment because then our traditional instruction, again, we either teach it on Monday, test it on Friday, or teach it for five weeks and test it in six weeks. But no, you can't be assessed for mastery or a demonstration of learning until the end of the year. And what this has done, this kind of change in standards is done in other states, is it has forced report cards to change because you're basically now reporting progress over time toward mastering the achievement at the end of the year. So it has a long ripple effect as we look at the revisions and the TEKS. So what are some of the big differences? Well, there's a lot of differences in the amount of speaking and listening and shared talking time with teacher and students and students to students so that they develop the word knowledge and oral language. And so therefore there are lots of standards now about speaking and listening. Now I have to believe that some of that is coming from uh, more recent reports of the impact of technology on the loss of language and speaking in complete sentences. And there are numerous standards now about speaking in complete sentences, writing in complete sentences, and subject-verb agreement. The word structure, the knowledge, the vocabulary, again, things that I've been talking about, you now see it. But we've been teaching students to memorize a lot, especially down in the lower elementary grades in pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, we have this emphasis on high frequency words. So I put in bold face here that by the end of the year in the Texas TEKS, that students need to recognize 25 high frequency words. And we're used to having, uh, we're used to having a lot more uh, memorization, encouragement of students to memorize a hundred, the first hundred Dolch words, let's say. So I think that we need to look at these outcomes so that our teachers don't continue 
traditional practices that are not required in these outcomes. Now, why did they change it? Because 100 words might be better than 25, because we're more interested in developing word knowledge and oral language and going deeper into understanding how words are used in reading text and how text is written and why it's written rather than memorize isolated words. So, again, looking at the rigor, if you look at the standards 12 and 13 and the TEKS, it's all about inquiry and research. And so they're generating these questions and inquiring and looking at evidence in the text to answer it. But here's the interesting part. The student does not have to demonstrate mastery because from kindergarten through grade two, the standards require adult assistance. So that means it affects our assessment. You cannot assess for mastery for the student to demonstrate achievement and grade it on a 100% scale if a standard says with adult assistance. Because what it's saying there is, is it is saying teach them more teach, teach more, don't assess for mastery because this is a difficult skill that needs a lot of repeated exposure, feedback from the teacher, and guidance. And so, again, that's going to affect teachers' classroom instruction and student practice activities. So how will we get that extra guidance and adult assistance in there is we're going to have to be working with these students in small groups. At grade three, they generate questions on a topic, and then at grades four and five, not only do they generate the questions and clarify the questions, and then they make predictions and inferences and use evidence from the text to cite uh, support for their opinion. So you see the scaffolding there. It begins with a lot of adult guidance. The adult guidance fades out around grade three, and the student begins to take on more responsibility to apply more rigor to answer the questions. When you look at the writing again, you'll see that same change in the learning progressions of easy to difficult, less to more. And there's a lot of teachers out there really pushing and promoting writing, and I'm going to show you where that writing is the highest form of language. It's the last thing we really ask the kid to do. It's, I'm not saying you shouldn't let them write, but we shouldn't demand that they write because if we'll develop the word knowledge and oral language, then the mouth will say and the hand will write and be able to express an opinion. So when you look at what the composition and standards and outcomes are for the writing process, you can see here this is, again, a kindergarten skill, plan and generate ideas, develop drafts, organize out ideas, revise drafts, but never does it say the student has to write it. Because if you look down where it says edit drafts with adult assistance, that means that this is a collaborative uh, shared writing activity, not all uh, not as a student always expected to do everything. So when you look at kindergarten and you see what I just went over on the left with adult assistance, what you see is they do the exact same thing but take it just a little further in first grade, again, with adult assistance, only this time there's a grammar requirement, subject-verb agreement, and then proper use of prepositions. Now, what does this mean for teaching? and practice. It means that we really need pre-K teachers and kindergarten teachers to do their fair share of the heavy lifting on oral language vocabulary and how to read and how words go together and what does a good sentence sound like and why we write them the way we do. A great foundational skill there because you can see that first grade will build on that and second grade will build on first grade. So what I did is I took the revised Texas Peaks and I combined all of the outcomes for English language arts reading for each grade level on one piece of paper, which I call them the Texas Big Sheets. The paper is printed on 11 by 17 inch, and I think that it provides a good work mat for having discussions like we're talking about today about what are these changes and how do they impact 
teaching and practice and assessment. And you can compare by looking at the Texas Big Sheets. You look first at the verb and determine what type of thinking is necessary here to achieve this outcome. What's the level of thinking required, the cognitive demand, if you will, on the student to be able to perform this standard? And then you highlight a few words that define the rigor. The rigor is what comes after the verb. The verb is going to be the level of thinking, but the rigor is the level at which the uh, outcome has to be performed. And this is the essential information that teachers and administrators need to talk about in their grade levels, in the outcomes and these standards. They need to know what is required of the student, at what level of thinking, at what level of performance of mastery, what is the rigor required here? Because if you don't know what that learning target is, you may not plan the type of lesson and practice activity that will prepare the student to perform at that level. So you're looking now at the kindergarten uh, Texas Big Sheet, and if you look at the upper left-hand corner, I'm showing you the skill set, and I want to show you how this progresses over time, because once you look at these standards, you can put kindergarten up to first grade, first grade and kindergarten up to second grade, and then so forth across the grade levels, and you will see these learning progressions, how they build upon each other year after year. What you will also see is that a lot of these are introduced at kindergarten first grade, and they may not require mastery or a demonstration of achievement out until second or third grade. That's what's critical. So when you look at where the second arrows are pointing, now you're looking and seeing that it's the writing component, it's composing. It doesn't say that the student has to print every word. It says compose. That could be teacher-led, teacher-supported, manipulating words on a card that demonstrates how English words fit together to say a, a statement or ask a question. When you look at first grade, you see in the upper left-hand corner, it's the same standards with just a little increase of uh, rigor. And then you look over in the writing and you see it again. So this is the way you can take the Texas Big Sheets and compare grade to grade to grade and look at what goes together and how it builds over time. And then the discussion here in grade two, you see again, the upper left is very similar to grade kindergarten and first grade, but a little bit more rigorous. And then you go out to grade two, and it works the same way in grade three. And then now you're looking at how you can compare all of them across time. And what needs to happen here is a teacher collaborative discussion about how are you introducing that at kindergarten because it has an impact in first grade, second grade, third grade. So we get more consistency across time in the way that we introduce practice and teach skills in the classroom to achieve these more rigorous outcomes. So the way that the TEKS are going to impact teaching and practice is going to be that we need a lot more rigorous instruction. And that means it's going to involve more teacher leader discussions. It's going to involve a lot more modeling or feedback, higher quality instruction, and I'm going to suggest that that is provided as an overview in whole group. In other words, you would start your lesson in whole group with all of the students and possibly introduce the vocabulary words or the big ideas, but it would not be where you'd explicitly teach and teach deeply, but instead you would save that for small group instruction so that you could give students feedback at the point of need. And then that will help provide the repeated exposures required by the research for us to internalize the information as long-term knowledge. But they also need additional practice to develop that oral language. And that's where having the students work with assigned peers or in small groups in collaborative practice, they will, again, use those words, discuss that text, 
reread uh, parts of the text, write in response to that text, but answer questions that involve a lot more uh, deeper understanding and rigorous application of the content. Does that mean we need to change all of our activities? Not necessarily, but we might use them a little bit differently because you may have students reread certain parts of the text and then answer the questions orally as a group, not with you or with you, or then the next day they might answer them in a written response to the group, and then maybe day three, then they write the responses to the questions independently. But what we're not doing, especially in, in aligning with this rigor, is we're not providing enough instruction on the front end and repeated uh, collaborative practice before we're asking these students to perform independently with this more rigorous text. So that's kind of the gradual release model that uh, Doug Fisher and Nancy Fry write about. Actually, Pearson wrote about it before then. And that means that we're going to have a lot of teacher responsibility at the beginning for introducing new content and new skills. And this is true whether it's pre-K all the way through grade 12. A lot of middle school and high school teachers tell me, well, they should have learned to read in elementary school, and they did. A lot of the students read and read well, but they read elementary text. As the text and the thinking becomes more challenging and more rigorous, the teaching must go up with it because it needs more rigorous instruction to be able to achieve those kinds of outcomes that are now in the TEKS. And so more rigorous teaching, more repeated practices in collaborative practice, we need more of that before students are asked to work independently. So what happens is the teacher leads heavily in the beginning, and then over time, the teacher begins to fade out that support and the students assume more responsibility for their learning. So what does it mean? How does it impact? What we're going to have to do to change, uh, make changes in the classrooms, first of all, we need to know the end of the year outcomes, the learning targets. What are those outcomes in the revised TEKS? And we're going to need it not only in, in reading, you're going to need to know it in math, science, all of the content areas. But today we're talking about reading. So you can use the Texas Big Sheets, and that will help you identify those learning targets and have that discussion of how are you teaching it at this grade level because it has an impact later. You need to know your students. What can they do? You won't know where to begin instruction if you don't get in small groups and understand what they can do and the teachers are going to identify what they need to do so their instructional journey will be between where they're performing and what these learning tar targets are in the teachers. And then we're going to need to have the discussions of what do we need to do differently. Differentiating instruction means teaching differently. How do we need to change teaching? How do we need to incorporate more collaborative practice with the students working together with the sign peers or in small groups, working with the teacher for explicit instruction in small groups? How are we going to change classroom practice to help students achieve the type of thinking that will be required for these revisions? And then we're going to monitor and reteach and then listen in small group, give feedback, assess monitor their progress, report their progress over the time, and then we would assess for demonstration of achievement at the end of the year. So what's happening is these revisions are going to have a huge impact. So where do we begin? Again, use the Texas Big Sheets and identify the end of year outcomes. Don't expect mastery because it's not required until the student has had a grade level years worth of instruction, increase the rigor in teaching. Notice I'm not saying increase the difficulty, I'm saying increase the rigor, more quality teaching, quality questions that require students to think, and then encourage your teachers and administrators to collaborate across your grade levels and begin to use evidence-based practices. And that's uh, practices that are based on the evidence from research that works. So thank you for attending. Uh, Bella, I'm going to turn that back over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Gibson. Uh, very valuable information. 
And um, at this time, Dr. Gibson would be more than happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, if you have questions, just use the chat feature at the bottom right-hand uh, corner of the, of the webinar. It doesn't look like we have any uh, questions for Dr. Gibson. So again, I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Gibson, and everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate your participation, and we hope to see you all again at our upcoming webinars. Have a great evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.